that we have um, uh, a healthy audience uh, in relative to the room size. <laughs> um, so thanks again. Uh, my name is Susan Chalmers, and I am the policy lead of Internet New Zealand. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to our panel this morning, Internet Copyright Policy, Multi-Stakeholder or Multilateral, um, which Internet NZ has organized in conjunction with IFLA, or the International Federation of Library Associations, and our colleague Stuart Hamilton um, from IFLA is in, um, in the audience, and he will be helping out with the roving mic throughout the session. Um, so a quick housekeeping note, um, please, if you, if you tweet from the session, welcome, come in. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> if, you, if you tweet from the session, um, we'd like to ask you to use at least um, two hashtags, the first being IGF 2013 and the second um, being hashtag SEC, as in the first three letters of the word security, which um, will signal that this workshop is part of the security, legal, and other frameworks sub-theme. Um, the IGF Secretariat has asked us to do this um, because if we do this, uh, you'll be helping us uh, track the discussions at the IGF in a more organized manner, and it will also help take content at friendsoftheigf.org, which if you haven't taken a look at that site yet, please do. It's a living project, and its purpose is to make the discussions at the IGF more accessible. So how do we define success for the session? Well, I think that the session will be successful if we have a really healthy, colorful, uh, robust, and open debate on where international norms for internet-related copyright policy should be developed. Um, so throughout the session, I, let's ask ourselves, which is the appropriate venue for developing this type of policy? Should copyright policy for the internet environment be developed in a multi-stakeholder forum? How would that work in practice? Or is it the status quo um, of the state-based uh, multilateral fora? Is that more appropriate, more sensible? And uh, what are free trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will actually set copyright standards for, for 12 countries um, um, outside of these, these two processes? So we are very fortunate to have representatives from intergovernmental inter organizations, the private sector, and the technical community on our panel to guide us in this discussion. So we have 90 minutes together today, and um, we'll begin by introducing this esteemed panel of experts who will then give brief opening remarks. I will then pose questions to the panelists, and um, after our panel discussion, we will touch base with the remote participants. Um, our remote moderator is um, Ellen Broad from IFLA. Thank you, Ellen, for helping out. Um, and we'll, we'll invite questions from the remote participants and from you as well for the panel. And then what we're going to do is open up uh, the discussion to the floor. So our panelists have thought about questions in advance that they'd like to ask you. Um, so the conversation becomes yours. And, uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to engaging in um, conversation with everybody here. The room's not necessarily set up um, to accommodate that naturally because anybody who's behind the front row is, will be talking to the back of somebody's head, but let, this, <laughs> let that not dissuade us in engaging in an open conversation. Um, after our discussion on the floor, um, we'll be returning to the, panels, uh, to the panel and I will ask each panelist uh, to give closing remarks, summarizing the, their insights from the session, and then we can all go to lunch. Uh, so let us again like to introduce um, our panelists. Um, first, we have Konstantinos Komaitis, um, who is the policy advisor at the Internet Society, and he focuses primarily on the field of digital content and intellectual property. Um, before joining the Internet Society in July 2012, Konstantinos was a senior lecturer at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, the UK. Konstantinos holds a PhD in law and also two masters, and he is based in Geneva, but truly wished he could travel back in time. <laughs> Next we have Paolo Lanteri. He is a lawyer um, specialized in intellectual property, 
um, and a member of both the Spanish and the Italian Bar Association. He works in the Copyright Law Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Next, we have Nick Ashton Hart, who is the Geneva representative of the Computer and Communications Industry Association. And last but certainly not least, we have Giacomo Mazzone, who is the head of institutional relations to the EBU, which is the biggest broadcasting union of the world, with members in 58 countries and includes, amongst others, the BBC, RAI, ARD, RTVE, and France TV. In this capacity, Giacomo has partnered with the UN system, system since WSIS 2003 in Geneva. The EBU is the member of the GAC at ICANN, and also um, there are members of the EBU MEG at the IGF. So welcome all to our panel. And um, I, I suggest that we just proceed um, with opening remarks, and then we'll move into uh, question time. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am very happy to be here, uh, and thanks for uh, coming to this workshop. So I think that uh, part of the reason that this workshop was chosen is because it is uh, because of how timely it is. Uh, discussions on copyright are, as you, I'm sure you all know, have been uh, part of the internet governance debate for many, many years. Uh, over the years, they have increased and they have intensified. And um, the internet community, uh, as well as uh, the entire uh, content uh, community, has been uh, seeking ways to advance the discussions in order to make copyright, to fit copyright, if you want, within the realm of the Internet. The challenges are many, uh, the difficulties are many, and the questions are very hard. Uh, so choosing a model to proceed on how to advance copyright discussions and how to make sure that copyright actually uh, walks along uh, with the Internet instead of competing uh, with the Internet uh, are becoming more and more crucial. Uh, in this context, we, we see that uh, those discussions are taking place at the IGF, uh, at various other uh, organizations, intergovernmental or non-governmental. Uh, and in the beginning at least, but I think that increasingly we see this happening less and less, there was this uh, tension between uh, copyright uh, with multi-stakeholder participation. I really think that we are way past that. I think that we are in a stage where uh, the different stakeholders are all sitting down and they are having very substantive discussions. And I have seen those discussions actually happening. I have seen them also in places where uh, you wouldn't normally uh, expect these discussions to, happening, to happen, and one of those places that I can think of is the Internet Engineering, um, uh, the ITF, the Inter Engineering Task Force, where people were talking about content in relation to standards, and I think that this is a very welcoming um, evolution of the discussions and the way they will uh, help us uh, at least identify better the problems and start uh, looking for uh, answers. So I will stop here because uh, I don't want to start giving away what uh, I will be discussing. But uh, I think that this is, this, we should see this as the beginning of uh, an ongoing, of rationalizing better yet what we want to achieve through these discussions. And what we really want to achieve, I believe, is find mutually agreeable solutions that we can all live with uh, and be able to ensure that content uh, owners are protected, that the public at large is protected, and that the Internet is uh, secured. My turn. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Constantinos, and thank you, Susan, for the introduction. Well, first of all, of course, thanks. Is it working? Thanks to the organizer for setting up uh, such an interesting workshop and for letting us participate in, I mean, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, I believe uh, it raises... A, very important question, which is analyzing and comparing two systems, the multi-stakeholder and the multilateral approach. This question touches very closely the life, the daily life of multilateral organizations such as WIPO. Uh, those two approaches are very intertwined and 
interconnected in my view uh, and a successful copyright policy would need to requ would require both both uh, uh, both processes uh, they need to play uh, their roles this is particularly true in the context of uh, copyright policy in the digital environment which is ultimately a question also of uh, the viability of culture in the 21st century which is a question that will uh, concern potentially all the internet users in the planet. So the dialogue must be as broad as possible. We have some successful story to tell in uh, copyright uh, policy development. Of course, I'm referring to the two diplomatic successful diplomatic conference. We can dig into the details of those if someone is interested. But one outcome of those two diplomatic conference was this, the stakeholders played an essential role. Without them, those results would not have been possible. And uh, they represent solid and balanced copyright uh, developments. And um, so rather than looking at those two approaches as alternatives, I would suggest uh, to look at them as uh, complementary. They can enhance each other. So the success uh, we know, we know in uh, looking at previous experiences that the success of any multilateral process uh, lay down uh, on uh, a broad uh, multi-stakeholder approach. And I'm looking forward to hear your views and your uh, opinion and suggestion to make this uh, even more effective than what it is now. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of which uh, I was supposed to be a much more active um, one, but I got involved in organizing of too many other things, including one of the main sessions. And so uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here as almost a free rider on the organizing list. Um, uh, I, should, I should preface my comments by saying that um, I, CCI's members are some of the, the most financially <coughs> successful internet companies um, and so tend to be disruptors of established business models. Um, before that, I was actually a music manager. I managed featured artists, so I represented a constituency that was frequently seen as disruptive of the status quo, even while being a rights holder representative. So um, uh, I may be, for two reasons, slightly disruptive uh, here in terms of the ideas that I put forward, but um, I, I think that the, the, the two conferences that WIPO uh, that were just referred to by Paolo um, are instructive in what they succeeded in and in what they pointed out about how the existing framework is developed, which is that we have countries who focus on legal architectures um, to which the beneficiaries of those protections are largely interested bystanders. Um, and so the, the outcome the outcome is not designed necessarily around the result and the effectiveness of the result is designed around a political compromise. And this is standard treaty making. But in, in an online world which is fundamentally global, uh, where copyright is fundamentally national, you have a sort of a square peg in a round hole problem. And so I think if, 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 you, if you, we want to have good laws in this area, amongst others, I think we're going to have to have uh, some amendments to process that incentivize the outcome, that's the objective outcome that is sought, and focuses on the, those immediately concerned with that outcome. Um, I, I, I mention this because um, I found myself, uh, as, a, as an observer, participating in the Treaty for the Blind from its very beginning, in which CCI was always very supportive of. And, and I had to intervene in various times to say, you know, this is not actually about the technology industry. It's not about the film industry. And in fact, it's not actually about publishers of books. It's about a market failure to provide access to the visually impaired. And so the, the, what we should be focused on is what do the visually impaired need given a market failure of standard commercial terms to provide books in reasonable quantities. And 
if that had been the objective, I mean, it was the state's objective, but if the negotiating had been set up in a way to focus only on that result, it wouldn't have taken four years. It wouldn't have been so painful <laughs> for everyone who participated in it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we, we, we have to, if we're going to change things to work for a globalized world, having simply national governments negotiating amongst themselves for, for their national perspective fundamentally will, will always be a challenge. Um, I mean, I, I have argued on a number of occasions that I don't think copyright law per se is necessarily such a problem. It's the way it's run, it's the way it's administered, and the fact that it is administered nationally uh, and is terribly complicated in how licensing works is more an impediment to, to access and use and cost than, than the actual laws in question, which have a good deal of flexibility and are implemented very differently in different countries. Um, so I, I, I think uh, that would be my, my question to all of you, is, is it possible to imagine a framework for evolving the, the, the copyright system in a way that incentivizes the outcome more than the participants? Thank you. Uh, I thank also the organizer for this uh, interesting initiative. I think that uh, this is a crucial problem. Even if I remember that at the beginning of the WSIS, one of the uh, first um, recommendations that we got was not to talk about uh, intellectual property within the IGF. This was removed, uh, luckily, but just to give you an idea of how we, where we were 10 years ago uh, in Tunis when uh, the IGF was created. Um, but let's say that um, as broadcasters we have um, a double approach to the problem because uh, our members are a lot, uh, they have a lot of uh, copyright ownership because they produce a lot of contents or they uh, achieve a lot of contents for the broadcasting use. But also uh, we are licensing a lot of things for our daily uh, activities. I think that in this case, in this panel, what is more important for you is our um, role as licensing, because this is the main problem we are discussing. So I will treat this aspect, forgetting for a moment the, the problem of the ownership of the rights. Um, I think that um, our experience is double-fold in the sense that um, even in licensing we, have, uh, we go through international treaty, so we are part of WIPO, negotiation, very active. We, um, since many years, we are uh, fighting for obtaining a broadcasting treaty worldwide that is blocked uh, by many different interests, I think, for misunderstanding in the real interest and real long-term global interest, but uh, this is a reality. But also we are uh, negotiating day by day um, on our uh, national basis, on a regional basis, uh, contract with the other parties in the rest, so we, we practice in the life of the everyday the two aspects and the two policies. And as Paolo said correctly, there is not one against the other, but they are complementary. But from our observatory of having this twofold approach, I can see one main difference. In the, um, in the multilateralism negotiation, you achieve a certain level of protection that is shared by everybody. So then all members of the European Broadcasting Union are equal. The Slovenian television that has two million uh, viewers but produce a lot of content and distribute a lot of contents in its own language has the same level of protection that uh, has BBC under a treaty. While if we go for bilateral negotiation or multi-stakeholder negotiation, then the difference between BBC and Slovenian television is enormous because BBC has uh, the legal department, 40 lawyers. They have a standard form and contract for everything. They know they have sub license agreements in, in all the countries of the world. While Slovenian television, they have only us as a reference for doing so. So let's say that the, the multilateralism is a basic protection for everybody. That means that the basic level of rights and uh, opportunities are shared by everybody. 
while if you go if you move in the multi stakeholders then the problem is the size the size become the, the main factor and then the, there is discrimination between different realities and because for us as union i'm talking as union of course um, for us it's equally important the slovenian television and the bbc they have by the way, Slovenian television within the rules of the EBU has more votes, three times more votes than BBC, because BBC shared with Channel 4 and ITV, so 24 votes, BBC has eight, while Slovenian television or Vatican radio, they have 24 votes. So they count in term, electoral terms within the EBU three times more than BBC. It's a joke, because in reality, we. The, the, the weight within the organization is uh, very important because the practice, the knowledge uh, is relevant and uh, shared by everybody. But let's say from this approach, the multilateralism is a guarantee. So we, I think that we have not to renounce to it because then it will be uh, a disadvantage for the smaller reality. And because for us, we believe that in each country is important what the, the public service broadcasters, because mainly we represent public service broadcasters, but even national broadcasters, they do for national culture, for national language, for national identities is important. We believe that this minimum level of that is given by the treaty is important. Then, of course, I realize, and I agree with you, that the, the, the process, process has to be as sm smoother as possible and give real equal opportunity to access even beyond what the treaty minimum level guarantees. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of our panelists. Um, I think we're, we're going to move into asking questions now. And just to give you an order, um, Paolo, I will start with you. Um, Nick, you'll go second. Giacomo, uh, third. And Constantino's fourth. Um, so, Paolo, what are the lessons that we can learn from past and present experience of copyright policymaking in multilateral fora? Well, thanks for the question. I think I found very interesting the opening remarks because they touch upon most of the issues that I was I'm going to refer to <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting how we are all talking the same language at the end of the day um, I believe uh, we have uh, many recent and pre present experiences from which we can learn a lot in the context of the actual negotiations in copyright policy at the international level not only the already mentioned diplomatic conferences, but also several sessions of the, the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, which is possibly the best example of a multilateral forum that develops uh, international copyright policies in terms of norm setting. So what we learn is that in a way or another, multilateralism can deliver under certain conditions. And uh, first of all, we need a political engagement, a commitment. And in this field, it's essential to the, to the, to the life of a multi-stakeholders -stake group to advise and create poli political attention on important issues you are concerned about. That's the first step. Then we need defined objective, realistic scope, allowing focus negotiation of member states. Another, and possibly is the most important lesson we have learned, you, have, you refer to, those, uh, to, that, to that lesson, is the challenge of consensus. There is a non-written rule within uh, WIPO norm setting processes, is that no one can disagree on the process. We have 186 member states, almost double number of observers, and it's enough to have one member state disagreeing to stop or slow down the process. That is both the main reason for the problem, the lengthiness, I mean, it's the slowness of the, of the response, but at the same time is also a guarantee for a balanced solution. We learn a lot about the role of stakeholders, I already mentioned it. Without a stakeho stakeholders behind, nothing is gonna happen. Stakeholders have crucial roles to play, not only in raising the political concern, but advising on a technical level member states instructing them on what are the real concern, the practical concern you are facing every day. And we all know, we all know that stakeholders are doing that in, uh, in, uh, in the YP forum. So the engagement of stakeholder is a founding pillar of the multilateral 
process as we know it. And this is true if we look at policy from a norm setting perspective, strictly law, treaty making. But as was mentioned by all panelists, in the digital environment, law is only a piece of the puzzle. We have, I mean, it's not a solution, it's just establishing the general framework within the ecosystem develops every day. We have at least uh, copyright the infrastructure of the system, we have the licensing practices, we have the stakeholder agreements that can play at least an equally important role in shaping and developing policies. There is no success in copyright policy if you only limit it to law. And if, what, if it was clear looking at the legal making, uh, the treaty making process that stakeholder had major role to play, if you look at the second uh, part of the, uh, of the puzzle, or if you look at the, uh, n the, the infrastructure and the licensing, I believe multi-stakeholderism is, in a way or another, already uh, into force, already effective in shaping the copyright policy. And I think this is the way we should, uh, we can, it's one of the ways you can look at the things, how they stand. Then looking forward, they can be certainly in be improved, no doubt. But this is uh, what I believe is a sort of, uh, I mean, analysis of the, the recent years in copyright, uh, copyright uh, policy making in the multilateral setting of WIPO, which is the one I know the most. So I'm looking forward to further discussion on that, and I guess the next would be you. Yes, thank you, Paolo. Um, Nick, can you please um, discuss what you believe to be the strengths and the weaknesses of um, the current status quo for the development of internet-related copyright policy? Hmm. Well, that's, that's a broad subject. Um, well, um, <laughs> I guess that there's, there's something that's both a pro and a con. There are many, many, many venues where you can, you can be involve yourself in, in copyright policy. At the national level, in, in conferences, uh, the international level as an observer to negotiations, at regional, the regional level, uh, now, even in trade policy, we frequently see intellectual property as part of trade negotiations, uh, a, an area where it's particularly difficult to actually see what's going on. Um, if anything, there are more and more venues, uh, many of which overlap, um, which I, I guess gives people many chances to affect outcomes, but um, it requires you to have a great investment in traveling to places and people with expertise um, that's unaffordable except for a tiny minority. Um, and it, it, I think, particularly strains the ability of developing countries and LDCs who simply cannot man. They don't, they don't have the experts, nor do they have the ability to put dozens of people in dozens of places to do this. I mean, I, I'm continually struck by this in Geneva where you know, uh, me and my colleague are the two full-time people from the whole tech sector based in Geneva. And there are delegations who cover all Geneva-based institutions, of which there are like 26 or 36, with two or three people. And we only cover a small handful of those agencies, and we can't do it. And so um, it, it, it's, it's very hard, especially given that the Internet is global by nature, and you have all these fragmented places where policy is being developed. Um, I guess inherently you have to have some of that because you have to specialize a bit. You, you, you don't want to you know, do in trade things which are better done elsewhere, um, just like you don't want to do things in human rights which are really trade questions. Um, but uh, I, I do, there's, there's a proliferating number of venues and at some point, it will become really <laughs> it becomes very difficult to try and reconcile the the result. And for national legislatures, I suspect it must be a really difficult thing to try and keep up with practical developments with, with legal norms when they're coming in from so many different places and yet overlap on the same the same policy areas. Thank you. Um, so the pro proliferation of venues um, both creates opportunities for people to be able to um, participate, participate, but also creates challenges in terms of resource and um, tracking all the different conversations. 
Um, I'd like to turn to um, Giacomo now. Um, could you uh, describe what you think or how you think each, each stakeholder group um, in internet governance, so the um, government, private sector, civil society, and the technical and academic communities, how they uh, can contribute to the copyright um, policy development process, and what are the responsibilities of, of these actors in doing so? But I think that um, um, for us, multi-stakeholderism is something that is in, in the DNA, because within the EBU we have uh, members that are state broadcasters, we have members that are private uh, commercial enterprises, and we have uh, members that are foundation and so are related to civil society and they have a di direct link to the citizens. So multi-stakeholderism is something that uh, we are used to. Um, the essential um, requisites for progressing and, and finding a solution is the good faith of all the participants. Because, uh, of course, it, there, there are some situations in the copyright issue that um, where those that try to stop the process could take advantage of st stopping the processes because they, they are, or they are in a situation in which they are gatekeepers or they are in a situation in, in which they get uh, excessive remuneration that they will disappear or others they have no, they don't pay nothing so they have no interest to have any kind of remuneration. Um, so this makes the, the situation very difficult because uh, simply s uh, staying, sitting on a problem and not solving it could bring advantages to everybody, uh, to, to at least part of the, the, of the contest. So I think that the, the essential requisite is that we have to look at the long term because in the long term I think the interest of everybody is to have a system that works. Uh, only the short term perspective is uh, I have an advantage and then I sit on this advantage. So of course as every negotiation you need to renounce something of your privileges and your um, advantages of today in order to have a more stable and effective situation for the future. So the first requisite is the um, good faith. The second is the will to, to go to a solution soon. Um, because uh, when, we, when we started the process of the IGF in Tunis, we said we need five years more to reflect about the changes that we need to bring to the situation. Then five years later, we said, oh, uh, we need other five years to think about that. And then uh, this interla interlaced with the election of the UN Secretary General that doesn't want to be bothered by this kind of uh, nasty things, etc., etc. So we are going round in circle. Um, this doesn't work. Uh, you see what, uh, what uh, the Brazilian initiative, I think, that is saying that uh, we cannot continue uh, to going in circle without tackle, tackling the issue and trying to solve the issues. Uh, I think that we need to have this positive approach. We need to take some risk. We need to negotiate. Um, and um, this negotiation could be made by the stakeholders, multi-stakeholders, but knowing that at the end of the day the copyright laws are national laws, so the, the government r um, role is essential. You need to convince them that they have to keep away part of the, they have to give away part of their sovereignty. Uh, in the European Union this is a very um, lengthy process, not always successful, but uh, at the end of the day or at the end of the year or at the end of the decades, <laughs> or at the end of the 50 years, we, we achieve something. And I think that we have to have the same approach if we want to achieve something in this, in this direction. Thank you. Um, and we will turn to Konstantinos for the last question. Um, Konstantinos, please describe what you imagine would be the best model for creating international norms for the development of internet-related copyright policy. Thanks, Susan. So, many think that copyright and the internet, and I think that's where if you want the, the debate started many, many years ago on that basis, and we spent a lot of time discussing how incompatible copyright and the internet is. And uh, first of all, we, we really need, it's about time we step away a little bit from that rhetoric, uh, because the internet and copyright are not so incompatible. 
Copyright is about creativity. The internet is about creativity. Copyright uh, is about progress, the progress of science, and the internet is about um, innovation. So, uh, in the context of these discussions, a lot has to do with process. Uh, the Internet Society is a strong supporter and advocate of the multi-stakeholder model, and um, this is not accidental. Uh, and the multi-stakeholder model that did not really, if you want, appear out of sudden in 2005 in Tunis. Uh, if you look back and you speak to the technical community, a lot of the principles that they have applied in setting the standards of the Internet, have, uh, have, uh, you can see them being reflected to a certain extent within the multi-stakeholder policy-making uh, model. I'm talking about due process, I'm talking about uh, inclus uh, inclusiveness, I'm talking about uh, voluntary adoption of standards. Um, so uh, it, it, it is very, um, it, it is essential that we start thinking more of process. And SOPA and PIPA, for example, failed for two very clear reasons, uh, as well as ACTA. It was one on process. ACTA failed because a lot of stakeholders felt that they were not included and they, their only option, at least in Europe, was to take on the streets. And also because uh, there were some uh, aspects of the proposals that were touching upon the Internet and a lot of people felt that they could endanger the architecture of the Internet and the way it works. So these are two great lessons that we need to reflect on and we need to learn from. Um, so when it comes to uh, the procedural aspects, uh, multi-stakeholder participation takes a long time. It's slow, I know. It is, uh, it is arduous, it is tedious if you want, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it requires some very difficult discussions and it requires some more difficult compromises. But at the end of the day, it provides also the ability for everybody to sit at the same table and have uh, uh, a, a, an exchange ideas and uh, uh, exchange knowledge and know-how. And we need that because we need the technical community on the table because they need to tell us when we're suggesting something that this is really not working for the Internet. We need the content industry for exactly the same reason. They have the uh, many years of institutional knowledge of how to do things. And we need civil society because through the Internet, civil society has actually found the, the tool that they feel that they can be heard. So it is very important to make sure that we include them. Now, what this inclusion means, Paolo said that multi-stakeholder participation is already uh, in process. Sure, but I don't think it has fully materialized. And for many, many people, and we've heard it yesterday, we've heard it uh, day zero, where at the high-level meetings, we are hearing it, if you want, directly or indirectly. A lot of people are using the term, but without really fully realizing what it is. It has, it is we are uh, in a process of turning multi-stakeholderism, uh, uh, you know, making it more of a trend than actually trying to figure out how we can all sit down and work and try to figure out what is happening. The culture is changing, and the culture is changing really, really fast. The culture is being shaped by the Internet. This is definitely. So if we really want to make sure that we, we, we take advantage of this culture and we provide some answers and some uh, forward-looking, we really need to, to, to adapt to this culture. This is our job. How we're going to do that is I don't have an easy answer. If I had the easy answer, I think I wouldn't be sitting here. But I am one, one of the things that I'm sure is that if we sit down, we can learn from one another. And then the solution most probably will come. And this is, uh, so the idea of actually providing everybody a voice should be really non-negotiable and should be the minimum standard of multi-stakeholder participation. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone. Um, Ellen, just wanting to touch base. Do we have any questions from? Yes, we do. Um, 
Um, after we take questions from um, remote participants or, or comments, uh, then we'll open it up to the floor okay. for questions for the panelists. I'll just check that it is still just the two. And um, we, do we have the ability to turn the mic on for the remote participants or not? Because one is offering to just say it himself if we can turn the microphone on. If not, it doesn't look like it. Nope. All right. So I'll read it out. Sorry, difference. So I've got two questions. I'll ask the latter one first because we're still communicating um, on the remote discussion. Um, it's in relation to moving from a, like national-based copyright policy making to an international-based. Um, and he's asking uh, in reference to, it comes out of Konstantinos' comments, but I think it relates to quite a few of the comments made. Um, in reference to due process and establishing that at the international level. And he's saying it doesn't necessarily exist transnationally as it does nationally. And the question is, how do we secure fundamental liberties in uh, a newer context so that copyright policy operates? It seems to me that the problem at the international level, in whatever issue, is that we rely on legal traditions that are founded by acts of the people which set their rights prior to the acts of the government including statutory rights like copyright to secure fundamental rights. Um, and I think that's the end of the question. Sorry, there's still some conversations going. So the question is, how do we secure, fund I think the summary of the question is, how do we secure fundamental liberties in the multi-stakeholder context if we move to an international, um, away from national-based copyright policy making, so that copyright policy to secure fundamental liberties. Crystal. Um, uh, this, uh, so I think if we were going <laughs> to ask a question, we're just looking at how, maybe how to secure that these um, fundamental rights are taken into account and um, at the international level. So would um, would anybody like to take that question on? Okay, uh, so <laughs> if, if I have understood this right, I don't think that it, it is very difficult to do that. I mean, all laws and all legal regimes, including that of copyright, come with ingrained, if you want, fundamental rights. I mean, we, we see fair use within uh, copyright. So uh, reflecting those into an international context, uh, it's not, first of all, it's not an issue because they're already there. They're already the checks and balances. Now, the, the multi-stakeholder, what it does, if you want, and this is the, the great thing, is that by allowing everybody to actually have a voice and provide their input, sort of, uh, enhances and secure those uh, fundamental rights and fundamental liberties. And I know that a lot of people do not see it because it's not crystal, uh, crystal cl clear, but the, 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 the question is not whether we, can, uh, 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 whether we can promote fundamental rights and fundamental liberties within international copyright discussions. The question is how to do that in order to take into consideration uh, a wide spectrum of stakeholders uh, participating in that. And we always tend to forget, for example, many, many times in those discussions, I keep on, uh, we keep on forgetting, uh, I hear that it's, you know, it's a tension between civil society and the content industry. Why do we forget the technical community? And the technical community has its own values. And those values, if you sit down and you actually take all these values separately, you will see that, you know, there are more commonalities than differences. And that might be a very good starting point because they also reflect fundamental rights and fundamental liberties. It's just that we use different, different stakeholders, use different terminologies. Um, Hi. This, this I'm sorry. This is... So um, we're, we're uh, used in the internet to being sort of almost persuaded that. Hi, can you hear me, anybody? Recent invention of, of <laughs> that, that comes from the internet, and in fact, it's very old. Um, there is actually a UN agency called the International Labour Organization, which I believe was founded in 1909, and it had the same fundamental problem: how do you create? How can you allow 
labor standards to be created solely by countries when the employer and the employed are the actual participants in this. And so the ILO was created with governments, employers, and unions all having uh, a role in making international labor standards. So it is actually possible to reconcile these things. And, and there are some, there's, there's some, an interesting analysis that was done because, of course, in ICANN there's a continuous debate and has been uh, for years on how to evolve ICANN structure and make it more international and less like a California company in the view of some. And um, Hans Corell, the jurist, the, did a, a report in 2006 on the different structural forms that exist um, aside from simple, classic, treaty-based organizations. And um, the ILO is extensively treated in there. So if you want to see some examples of how different communities over time have solved this need to have more voices at the table and more involved in a decision than just one or two, I think that's part of it. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Paolo, Can anybody hear me? Giacomo, do you have anything to add? Um, I think that a part of the question was not very clear, but um, I think that the, the essential reflection to be made on that is that um, we have in the copyright issue different kind of rights that conflict among them, uh, human rights. I mean, there is the right of the, of the uh, producer that has invested some money and want to have a return. This is a right. There is the right of the author that want to have his intellectual property properly remunerated. If not, there will be no creation in the world. There is the right of the citizen that want to access to this in a fair, easy, and uh, possibly cheap way. So the, the problem is all exactly that, how to contemplate all these rights in a hierarchy and uh, being fair all along the process, not forgetting any of them. And I think that the multi stakeholder process is the, is one of the best ways to remember and everybody could claim his own rights. Then the problem is that at a certain point of the process you need to assess who has the right to do what and until which point each interest has to be protected or has to be sacrificed in, in the name of the collective interest. The collective interest, the general interest has to be at a certain point the main thing that uh, has to prevail. This is why we have to look in the long term, because if we look in the short term, uh, we will never get out of the problem. I need to make a few comments on this point. I would like to say that, first of all, the guardians of human rights are possibly uh, others in the terms of uh, international context. And if we focus on copyright, as has been rightly pointed out, there are some conflicts in the system, but those conflicts are balanced, first of all, within the system, within the system, and the, the normative process that lead to that uh, uh, regulation has installed a lot of guarantees for broad participation. And then, ultimately, the, um, the process is led by governments I, and, uh, in, in this current context. So I, I wonder whether the question points that uh, uh, how do you uh, sort of guarantee respect of human rights uh, in a process where we don't have a direct contact, uh, a direct uh, mm. war? But we, we have to remember that it, mm, it's a different layer. You also have a, a possible multi-stakeholder participation at the national level, and governments are entrusted, and uh, they themselves have all the interest in respecting human rights in, in this process. On the side, in terms of procedure, a multilateral organization, a United Nations organization like uh, uh, WIPO, for instance, has very uh, solid uh, rules for participation. Within the rules of procedure, uh, obs observe, um, NGOs can be uh, have quite low uh, level of requirement to be member of uh, the uh, uh, obser uh, the, the observer's body, and therefore there is real, really, I, I don't see uh, human rights uh, uh, at risk in the current uh, multilateral framework. That's my point, and uh, uh, there is uh, quite high level of uh, uh, transparency in the 
the way norm setting is developed uh, in the current uh, setting. Thank you. So um, let us all be a bit, bit more multi-stakeholder ourselves right now. And I was, I'm, I'm going to ask the, uh, the, the panelists um, to list their questions to the audience. And I think we'll just list them all at once if um, you guys wouldn't mind writing them down and keeping, keeping them um, in your minds and then electing, just electing to respond to whichever one you'd like to. And then we're just going to um, have, have a discussion. Um, so if we could just, uh, who would like to start first? I mean, uh, Nick, you already um, asked a question, but would you mind um, reiterating? If I could remember what the question was, I would. <laughs> <laughs> um, did I write it down? Jet Travel and I are not on friendly terms, I'm afraid. Yes. Um, so I think it, it, it was really just uh, uh, relating to, to the venues, um, the self, if we're, we're looking at the characteristics of each of these different venues for the development of copyright policy, um, was kind of the gist of, I think, what you were asking. Um, but maybe we can just go to another I can panelist and we can think. Okay. So my, my question uh, was uh, that, I mean, given the current uh, status, I mean, what would be, I mean, uh, a realistic suggestion for improvement, practical suggestion for improvement of multi-stakeholder participation in norm-setting processes at the international level? We, I'm, I'm, I would be very curious and happy and uh, to, to hear your views and suggestions. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask the audience? Anyone else? Giacomo? We go one, okay. Yes, my question is uh, about um, the uh, public domain. I think that um, the next uh, endeavor for the WIPO after the Treaty for Disabled and Blind would be the public domain. Because we, as broadcasters, uh, but I think that this is the same problem for all the Internet community, we suffer of a very different uh, range of national definition of what is uh, public domain uh, or non-commercial use or um, educational purposes. All this gray area where, where there are a lot of um, abuse. For public service broadcast, this is particularly crucial and important because um, as you know, most of the contents that we produce uh, are remunerated and paid by citizens. So in a certain sense, they belong to citizens. This is different from commercial broadcasters or, of course, or other content providers. But for us, the citizens, they pay for this content. So when they have full right to access to this content, uh, this is a problem that is larger than us and I think that uh, may in a certain sense a lot of um, expectation of the internet community too. Thanks Susan. So how can we make sure that we find a way to marry the different discussions happening at different fora in the context of uh, international copyright? lawmaking. And when I say different discussions at different fora, I mean discussions like here at the IGF, discussions happening uh, at a national and international level, but between governments, and also discussions happening through uh, FTAs, free trade agreements. Uh, so we see different discussions happening at different levels. How can we make sure that we marry all these discussions in order to achieve essentially what I believe we want to achieve is a common goal? I'll ask a more specific question than a general one. How can we design discussions about changes to the, to the copyright system such that they are outcomes-based and incentivize participation in them, not simply for acquiring rights, but for, res for the responsibilities of exercising them? Because I think there's a lot of focus on People want rights of various kinds, but there's less attention paid to. But how are those to be used and for what? Thank you all. Excellent questions. And now, um, yeah, Stuart and I will roam. 
<laughs> please. Um, yeah, so. um, please state your name and um, your, your background, if you'd like. Hello, I'm Jonas Mäkinen. I'm from Finland. And I'm here as a part of an NGO, but I'm also a pianist and a composer and a singer, and I make school books. So I'm pretty much accustomed to copyright issues and everything concerning that. So what I wanted to point out concerning how to, how to improve in a concrete way the multi-stakeholder part is that as a person who makes materials that are by default copyrighted, uh, I very often find that the, many of the organizations that say that they talk on my behalf and everything, I really don't feel like it as a creator myself. And one of the parts that I would, I would really like to rise higher in the multi-stakeholder uh, discussion is academia. Because I keep reading again and again about uh, let's say, papers saying that DRM didn't help, it, ma it made people buy less, it didn't help creativity about copyright extensions, it actually made books less available instead of more available, and so on and so on and so on. And I find it pretty cruel that these, these sort of studies are not really, they are not discussed in newspapers, they are not really discussed in parliaments, they seem to be sort of a minority to really uh, be considered, and I find this pretty odd and slightly disturbing. <laughs> Thank you. And this Susan, is this Susan, is the we month. Have a, a oh, okay. Sorry. Hello, my name is Ludo Kaiser from the Netherlands. Um, I've been working with youth participation for many, many years. In the last five years, I've been a process designer for leadership journeys for top 500 companies, the CEOs uh, usually. Um, so I want to address uh, two questions of the of the gentleman. Actually, uh, your question about uh, suggestions for a realistic approach for the multi-stakeholder uh, discussion, as well as the well, design of the discussion, actually. I thought that kind of matched up. Um, uh, well, m having some um, experience in, in having multi-stakeholder uh, discussions in a different type of setting, obviously, um, one thing that I found out is that, uh, and actually my colleagues from the Future Firm and the uh, Oxford Leadership Academy, same thing, is that in most cases, having a discussion in a setting like this will not change anything. Um, because people are just standing up for what they want to put out, and that's it. So um, I know it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of strength and, and stuff like that, but we need to get outside of conference halls. We need to start sharing a little bit more of where we come from in a different type of setting and design a process that will definitely lead to a result. And that's the problem with most of these discussions of multi-stakeholder, it's just about the discussion, so there's no design which works towards a result. And at the end, it's up to us, uh, you know, here and on different platforms as well, if we decide that we want to make, truly make a change. And that, I mean, at the end, we need to make compromises, all of us. But we can only make those compromises if we understand a little bit more where we come from. And that will never happen in a static situation like we have all these multi-stakeholder approaches. So we need to get outside these conference rooms and we need to get inside each other's lives and really design a process on top of that which will have a, you know, have a result and there will be compromises there. Uh, it's up to us. And, you know, I've seen a lot of these now and, yeah, we can do this for another 15 years. So I'm fine with that, but, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. And just, um, I, I had hoped that we could have set the room up in a circle, to be honest, um, but in, um, unfortunately uh, we cannot. Um, Stuart? Actually, uh, I'm going to kind of use uh, organize a privilege because, Luda, that was kind of interesting, but can you give us an example of something that's been successful like that? I mean, I think it is kind of easy to say that we should get out of here and go somewhere else, but, but can you give us an example? Um, well, one example is, is, is from a business uh, perspective. Uh, I've been working with uh, the CEOs of Arcadis uh, the last year. Uh, Arcadis is the, one of the biggest engineering companies in the world. They bought up... Um, the, 
a couple of very huge engineering companies, for example, in the UK, the biggest one in the UK. So what happens there is that there's a multi-stakeholder approach within the company itself because there's different companies that they bought up and they have to get aligned, all of them. Well, that will never happen if they stay in their offices. So what happened, we design a journey, basically, a journey that, you know, will take people on a, a literally a physical journey for a couple of days. And in, that, in those days, we design a process that will truly get people closer together and, and uh, focus on the result for Arcadis. That's a, a global strategy which will uh, engage all the different business, uh, businesses within Arcadis. Um, so, uh, again, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. Uh, it, it, you have to put in money and, and uh, stuff like that where you're not used to put your money. But at the end, Arcadis right now, or I mean, we will see, but I'm sure that Arcadis in the next five to ten years will actually grow a lot more and, um, you know, truly get some results done. And we see the tower, for example, in London, which they're building right now. That's, you know, one of the, you, uh, the, the, the big one in, in London. I can't remember the name right now. Uh, but those are multi-stakeholder approaches within construction and within engineering that came out of these processes. So... I don't know if that clarified a little bit, um, and otherwise I'll, I'll be happy to show some more stuff, but we need to do that outside of here. Thank you. Obviously, the, the panel will come back and respond. Is there anybody else in the room who'd like to make a comment at this point? We've got uh, one over here. Um, I'm wondering if there's anyone in the room who's familiar with the uh, modernization of the Canadian Copyright Act and what became the Balance Canadian Copyright Act and a gentleman named Michael Geist. Is there just quick hands, hands up? Anyone? Okay, well, that's great. I'm surprised it hasn't come up as a kind of an example of um, advocacy-led activities and uh, civil society and town hall meetings and public awareness of copyright that thanks uh, in part to Michael Geist and, and his work, led to a lot of activity and eventually a, a, a multi-stakeholder approach to uh, copyright legislation in Canada. And I think that's a really good, good example of where uh, activities and advocacy for uh, the general public led, led to a really positive outcome on behalf of content creators as well as the general public. So uh, I don't want to speak too much on behalf of Michael Geist, who I met in Bangkok uh, a few weeks ago at an uh, impromptu talk he gave there. But I thought that's a really good example of how, uh, through a more organic and uh, blog-based, activist-based process, um, a multi-stakeholder approach was sort of forced on the Canadian government. And I think there was quite a good outcome as a result of that. Um, I'm Angela Daly. I'm a legal academic at the Swinburne Institute for Social Research in Melbourne, Australia. Um, just after that example of a kind of good um, multi-stakeholder process for copyright policy and law formation, I'll give you an example of a pretty bad multi-stakeholder process, which is the negotiations currently underway for the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is um, going to affect the Asia-Pacific region, and it seems it will bring about some major re reforms to copyright law. Um, similarly, there's speculation too that the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement, whose negotiations I believe have just started, will also include copyright provisions. Um, this is, like I say, this has been a very un-multi-stakeholder friendly uh, process. Uh, the negotiations have been in secret. We've only seen um, what the content of them actually is as a result of various leaks. Um, even parliamentarians in some of the parliaments uh, of the countries involved don't know what's going on. Um, so I have to say I'm pretty pessimistic about uh, the process of multi-stakeholderism in copyright law and policy formation as a result of what's going on in my adopted part of the world. Um, I think we have a gentleman with a microphone there. And I'm going to go here and then here, but I think first over here. No, uh, are you ready, sir? Or? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Nick Hilliard, uh, and I'm in the uh, technical community. Uh, and in a previous lifetime, I was uh, acting as expert witness um, in the uh, EMI and others versus Aircom uh, legal suit in uh, Ireland. 
Um, this suit uh, resulted, uh, or at least was part of a process of uh, bad relationships between the uh, copyright holders and the service provider community. And um, uh, there were a lot of issues, both within and without the, uh, uh, the lawsuit itself, uh, which um, exacerbated the problem and which uh, has caused a lot of division between the two sides. And I'm trying to work out how uh, we can get from there to a, a much more positive uh, multi-stakeholder approach. Okay, hello. Uh, Brzykovic from Public Citizen. Um, I want to add uh, some comments on the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and we were, we've been speaking here about the multi-stakeholderism. And when, you, when we talk, like, uh, my organization has attended all the TPP rounds, and we've been, we've been going to all around the Asia-Pacific countries, and we've been attending to all the negotiations that stakeholders. And when we talk to the USTR, because we are really concerned about the process, and it's not transparent, we have no access to tax, Luckily, the, the IP tax is, is leaked, so we know what the what US is, has been asking. But, but the problem is every time we talk to USTR and we, we raise our concerns, they were like, it's transparent. You know, there's a stakeholder day. And we go there, and it's for the stakeholders. With the industry, we make presentations to negotiators, and we, ha we, can, we can make appointments with negotiators. We can, we can tell our concerns. But the problem is, the, I, not the problem, the important thing is what happens after the stakeholders day. Because the thing is, stakeholders all around the TPP countries, they come that day, they make their presentations, they meet the negotiations, negotiators if they, if they are lucky, and then they leave. But what happens is the industry people, they stay there and they do lobbying. And I think when we talk about the multi-stakeholderism, the important thing is like there is another game there, which is lobbying. My organization is based in U.S. We based in Washington D.C., and we know what has been going on in the Congress. So the thing is like it's good to sit sit on the say, ta same table with the industry and discuss, exchange views. But you know when you go out of that room, they will keep on going doing their their own game, and it's all about the lobbying, and. Unfortunately, the copyright policy, international copyright rulemaking, is all about lobbying powers. And as civil society, we don't have any lobbying powers. Thank you, Virgil. Um, 